podcast of 98FM's Dublin Talks. Remember, catch the show live Monday to Friday at 10 a.m. 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy. Now, uh, next on uh, the programme, I have a simple question for you, and it is uh, this. Is the uh, Pope's visit to uh, Ireland an insult to the victims of of, uh, clerical abuse? As you know, Pope Francis will be visiting Ireland for uh, a major trip next week. Now, it's not that long. He'll be here in the country for barely two days. For many people under the age of 40, this is the first papal visit in their lifetime. But there's another side to this whole story. The abuse side. The fact that in Ireland, there are so many lives that have been ruined and deeply affected by clerical abuse. The question is, um, and we want you to get involved in this a little bit later on, is this papal visit an insult to the victims of clerical abuse? Is it opening up old wounds? Will it cause more harm than good? Or if Pope Francis apologises to all the victims, will it actually give them closure? Do you support the many survivors of clerical abuse who are angry over this papal visit? One survivor who's been very vocal about this is a man called uh, Darren McGavin, a victim of paedophile uh, priest Father uh, Tony Walsh. Darren has demanded an apology from uh, the Pope, and Darren is going to be telling us his uh, whole story. And can I just advise that if you have um, young people listening to the radio, you might want to switch off because some of this conversation may be uh, quite graphic. So if you, I'm I'm giving you a warning that if you have young ears around, you might want to take them away from the radio as the conversation that we're about to have uh, may become a little bit graphic. Darren, welcome to 98FM. Thanks for having me, Adrian. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. We worked together many, many years ago, as you reminded me the other day. Yeah. In a lovely place called the Spa Well. Yeah. It were uh, memories. <laughs> a dangerous place to walk. <laughs> it was, it was at the time. Anyway, Darren, welcome to the programme. Take me back to um, the start of your story and your first contact uh, with uh, Father Tony Walsh. Um, I was born in in Bally Farm, obviously in in the house in Thomond Road. Um, I came from a family of five children, um, two younger, two older. Um, Back in the house, it wasn't a very happy house. Uh, The father at the time was a bit of a drinker and... Um, there was violence in the house towards me and towards, I suppose, my mother. So um, when I was in school and stuff, um, especially from the age of seven-ish onwards, there would be marks or, or bruises or red cheeks, for the want of better words. Um, As a result of what would have happened at home? At home, yeah. Um, and um, when I made uh, my communion, we, we moved, obviously, from the age of four, we entered the Dominican convent and you crossed the road. Uh, to De La Salle Brothers, like an exchange of classes, and the brother would welcome you over. Um, we were introduced then uh, to Father Tony Walsh, a very charismatic guy, um, in hindsight looking back, very funny, a lot of time for the children, and would say and do things that most adults back then wouldn't have done. Um, so we kind of latched on to him, he was somewhat of a celebrity, he sang, um, he was one of the, the singing priests. He, he was one of the singing priests with, with Father Cleary, yes. Um, his, his house where he lived was attached to the, pro, to the Assumption Church. Um, so um, I got to get to know him, I suppose, over a very fast period of time. And I remember on one occasion going into school, um, I, I had a bit of a mark under the eye. And he had asked me what happened. And I told him I was lifting bins out with the brother. And I dropped my side because it was heavy. And um, I got a slap for it. And he said, I'll go down and have a yap at your mother now after school. And I was terrified because, as I said, there was violence in the home. So the last thing I wanted was another slap when he was gone. So he went in, had a yap, told the mother that he was aware of what was going on in the house with the father and the mother and with myself. And suggested that maybe I become an altar server. um, And he would take me under his wing and guide me, for Mm. the want of better words. Okay, so... That seems like a nice offer yes. from somebody who appeared to be caring. Um, I know uh, as a young fellow myself, I was an altar server. And if I'm to be honest, they were some of the happier, happiest years of my life. Um, 
but it didn't turn out that way for you. No, it didn't turn out that way at all. Um, I suppose uh, I became an altar server. I suppose in hindsight, again, everything is hindsight looking back because I'm not in the mindset anymore of a seven-year-old. Um, so I can't speak from, from that place, but I can speak from memory. So as, as a seven-year-old with not much affection at home, and as I said, there was, there was violence at home, and I was bullied in the schoolyard as well. Uh, there was a gang of lads we used to get bullied by. And I had a Christian brother, and he wasn't afraid to use the strap or the stick, let's put it that way. Mm. So uh, I kind of had nowhere to turn to. So to be taken off by a priest and become an altar server, and like he really had me on a pedestal, I really felt special. Uh, I really felt loved, cared for. Um, and he just seemed to, I know it sounds weird, had eyes only for me. He had me back. Um, even when the brother was giving me a hard time with the strap, um, he would he would nearly chastise the, the, the uh, Christian brother. Um, I was kind of special in a sense where it was a big deal to serve at a, a wedding back then because the best man used to leave a little envelope for the altar server or altar servers. So that you knew you were getting a slice of the cake that mm. day. But what I didn't cop was the grooming end of things, I suppose. Um, he would have regular access to taking me out of school. So he would come into the, the De La Salle and give the brother various scenarios that I was beaten at home or there was a mass to be said or I, I had to go somewhere with him. And I was just excused. And was it just you? Yeah, in that class there was just me, yeah. Okay, yeah. so the priest would arrive, he would excuse you from school. He'd never even knock at the door. He walked straight into the classroom. and um, Just take you out of the class? Take me straight out of the class, yeah. And uh, as I said, you, you would, you would, you, sometimes you would serve a wedding, but you would never go back to school. Um, there would be some kind of abuse that would happen. In the early stages, it would be... As I see it now and know it now as, as touchy, touchy, feely, feely, sitting on his lap. Um, he was a big Elvis fan, an Elvis impersonator. So we would be in the, the front room, the, the parlour I would call that, in, his, in the parochial house, sitting on his lap. And he'd always have a drinks there, like Taylor Key Orange and Red Lemonade and White Lemonade, Seven Up, Crisps, uh, Refresher, them Refresher Sweets, the Chalky Sweets. Mm. Um, and you would always be given something. Um, leaving and i suppose while you were there you were given something as well and you'd be just rocking on his knee so as i said as I it said, all it, seemed really friendly um somebody was caring for you somebody i could who, confide in yes that you can confide in about the bullying about the uh, what might have been happening at home yes. and somebody who i assume as a, as a young kid uh, you learned to trust oh i've trusted them implicitly i trust them more than my own parents believe it or not more than my own parents because back then there was so much going, I couldn't trust anyone. Um, I didn't have anyone. Um, so, as I said, even even in hindsight, looking back, there was days, I know it sounds a bit stupid, but there was days when I left that school at three o'clock, a half three, I would gallop, run non-stop up to that parochial house to make sure I was the first lad there. I remember one day in school, again, this sounds a bit weird, but I've, I've done a lot of work on myself, Adrian, to look at it for what it was. Um, I would see it no less than a relationship that you would have with your partner, that if you, the very thought of your partner ripping you off or sleeping with somebody else would send you violently sick and off your head. When I see him with other kids sitting on his lap, the rage and jealousy that was in me was... And what age would you have been then? I would have been, I suppose, it started, the grooming and the touching up would have started around seven or eight um, and onwards. Um, it was only as we, as we progressed, I suppose, if you want to call it, into the relationship, um, things got more serious as I got, it seemed to get more serious as I got older. And looking back now again in hindsight, it's probably because I was starting to cop on or not. And he found that a threat. So he, he would show me uh, depictions in the Bible, the old Bibles of hell um, and he would tell me that uh, I would born in hell for all eternity if I told anyone and um, I know I, I, I have expressed this I, I won't excuse myself as I said the show is what it is and on one occasion um, I remember winning a race it was like the end of De La Salle's day and there was races in the class in the school and I actually won something for once in my life for running 
And I went back and I was very proud of myself. And he brought me back and we were having a bit of fun. And he was saying, God, you bet you think you're it running. You're a great runner and all that. And I was chuffed with myself with the medal I got. And there was a, a coffee table in the in the room. Um, and he uh, put me over the coffee table and uh, tied me hands to me feet with the, the rope, ropes off the vestments that he had. And uh, he put a music, some uh, Elvis on. And uh, he uh, he raped me. Uh, he, there was no messing about, or I won't even use the word far play. There, there was nothing. He, he just went straight in. Um, I remember. I just I just kept crying, and I heard on the in the parochial house when you opened the front door there was room to the left and the right and a stairwell straight in the middle it was nearly if you think of it like a crucifix and i could hear somebody and i was aware father brown was in the house he was another priest i shared the house with him and i was praying to god i remember saying please please knock on the door please please and he says to me um do you remember um i told you about um burning in hell for all eternity and i said yeah and I had never, I didn't cop that he had a light and candle. Um, it was one of the ones we used to use for a communion. And the candle was lighting. And um, I didn't see him take the candle. But I knew I could smell smell the wax. And then I just felt this very severe burning. Oh God. I'm talking uh, with Darren. And Darren has been very vocal and very public about the abuse that he suffered at the hands of of a priest called Father uh, Tony Walsh. And I'm just looking at some of your text messages and many of you remember Father Walsh. Uh, many of you, um, I, I, like we got a message there. I grew up with Darren and Ballyfermot and remember that effort Walsh in the schools and church and the kids talking about him. Darren, you were explaining to me there and I can see, you've spoken about this many times and I can see the pain in your eyes just as you're you're talking one of the reasons that i wanted to talk to you face to face rather than uh, on the phone was to to feel that um you win a medal you're delighted with life and your reward from a priest that you trusted that you looked up to uh, that was your mentor almost as a young kid your reward was to be raped and have candle wax poured on you um, the candle wax wasn't poured on me, Adrian. Uh, the candle was inserted inside me. Jesus. Um, so when I tell you, I felt the lingering born of candle wax. Um, I knew exactly what he meant when he said, "I'd born in hell for all eternity," and that fear still carries me through today. I suppose to some extent. Um, and what happened after that? Then I, I basically defecated myself in front of him. Um. I, I couldn't stop going to the toilet. It just kept coming out and coming out and coming out. Uh, I had no control over my bowel movements at all. So I suppose there was an embarrassment on my behalf uh, towards that. And I suppose looking back, um, I was definitely afraid to say that and then because he had one over on me. Um, I, I couldn't even explain how much came out of me. Just everything came out of me. And the whole while that this is going on, he was playing, uh, and people need to realise, this guy was a, a singing priest, he was an Elvis impersonator, he was part of a, a troupe that, of priests that toured around the whole country. He was, while he was raping you, playing loud Elvis music so that nobody else could hear anything that was going on in that room. Yeah, he, and, and I know he heard somebody on the stairs because what he'd done was... Um, it, um, he he uh, stopped doing what he was doing then because he had, he had raped me. Um, he he opened the window and then uh, heard the music up, and then he went back in again because even in court, um, when the sentencing was imposed on him, because of the amount of alleg the amount of, of um, I suppose ab ab abuse counts against him, the judge going to sum that 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 episode up as a rape, um, a kidnapping and a rape. Because he went in twice, um, and that's why I, I feel it, I got a 16 year sentence with far taken off of good behaviour on appeal. Tell me about uh, the regularity of that abuse. Um, how often did this happen? How often 
did he rape you? How often did he abuse you and over what period, what length of time? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question because um, legally, um, when, you, when you're bringing a case forward, the DPP, who are, who are you're, you're basically just a witness, um, they won't go with everything you tell them because they can't. It's, it's so overwhelming and unbelievable and trying to get times and dates that are afraid it will fall to bits when it gets to court. So they had to go on a thing called sample, sample, charges, sample yeah. charges. So they went on 16 sample charges. But that's not, that's not Darren McGavin. Um, Darren McGavin, as I said, was accessed three to four times. Even if I was kind to that man and said twice a week, um, that was every uh, twice a week from the age of seven up to five. I mean, do the maths. Seven up to the age, seven up to the age of twelve. Uh, so if you do the maths on that alone, that will give you some indication as to what was done. <coughs> now in court, the judge had um, instructed the jury that they could find uh, Tony Walsh guilty of molestation and not rape, but they cannot find him guilty of rape and not molestation. So that would be two two different things. Um, the, according to the guard, uh, Brendan Walsh, that was heading the investigation for me from Ballyferma and Gabriel O'Gara, um, when the jury came back, they came back very, very quickly. And he was found guilty on all counts unanimously. So that that's why he, we made legal presidents in this country where a man, that's why he's so notorious. Uh, even before the Murphy, the Murphy report uh, or in the commission, he's the most notorious uh, sex offender to come before the courts in Ireland. Um, in court, all the charges totaled 123 years, but because they ran concurrently, he got 16, and then on appeal, they took four off it. For what I don't, I don't know. I'm still immune at a loss. I, at a loss, I can't understand why. But that's 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 just justice for you. So between the ages of 7 and 12, twice a week? Minimum, would, minimum twice a week. Twice a week. And would it always involve uh, rape? Would it always involve something sexual? Um, how bad? Well, I, I mean, uh, listening to the way you described that story of the day you, you, you got the medal, um, was it always that bad? No, it wasn't. There were, there were the isolated events like that uh, throughout, throughout the... Um, I suppose the five year period. I just want to add if I can as well, Jeremy, there was a lot of things I gave him my statement um, um, that he was prosecuted on. And I had a yap with Dermot Martin about this after the court case. There was a lot of things. Um, yet if you think that candle episode was um, strong, I could, I could bend your bones with other stories. But I, I, I saved myself from the embarrassment of having to say that in court in, case, in case my family were there. Um, Embarrassment. Well, yeah. I mean, sometimes you're, you're telling something, and like I was afraid I wouldn't be believed. First of all, because it was so, so horrific of the some of the other things he he done. Like I'm not sure. I may as well say it while I'm here. Like uh, on one instance, there was a crucifix used. Um, on another instance, I don't know whether you remember years ago. Um, that a large bottle of Seven Up. Um, it came with a very pointy um head to it. Uh, it was one of them used on me. So they were they were other instances of stuff that happened, but I kept that out of the domain of court because I was afraid that it would leak out and my parents would hear it and what effect it would have. Because up to that point... Oh, and you say what effect it would have? Uh, affecting them not believing you? And affecting... Yeah, affecting uh, them I mean, not who, believing Who could possibly me. make stuff like that up? And Well, not only that, I was trying to protect my family as well, Adrian. I, there was only so much they, they were capable of hearing. Um, they had been through a lot with me through suicides um, and being admitted to psychiatric units um, flat lying going to hospital dead on arrival so I was trying to spare them that and I was afraid that if I was in court and they got upset I wouldn't be able to defend myself because I'd be too worried looking at them getting upset Give me a word to describe uh, that man Father Tony Walsh one word Unhuman. Unhuman would be a, a word I, I would use. Um, I'd, nobody's ever asked me that question before, actually. I, I don't know. Unhu unhuman. Mm. Because I can see, like I said, uh, I mean, obviously him being locked away was to an extent closure until uh, you got slapped in the face and they took four years off. Um, 
having him locked away, what did that do for you? Um, it didn't do anything for me. Um, I had a thing in my mindset, um, Adrian, when I took this case on, I, I promised myself and the little boy inside me that I would represent him and pick up for him because nobody else did or nobody else could. And I wouldn't allow anyone else to. Um, and I always made a promise and I, I kept my goal achievable that I will get this to court and if the DPP fecks up, that's their business. If the judge doesn't believe it, that's his business. And if the jury failed to see the truth, that's their business. It's nothing to do with me. I just promised myself I would get it to court and after that, even if he got locked up for a day, that's none of my business. So, whatever he got, he got. Um, I just didn't get why they needed to take four years off because even on some of his other cases, um, he, 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 in 1997, he was done for six lads and reduced to six years. So I don't understand why these people have the power to lock these people up to protect children and then give them four years off for good behaviour. Good behaviour for what? He's locked up. He's not going to hurt anyone. So you want to give him good behaviour because he's locked up? It doesn't even make sense. He has been described by many as like Tony Father Filth Walsh. And you know the way newspapers put these uh, tags on him. Yeah. Um, <coughs> he was a representative. I, of call, the, I call him the Beast of Ballyferma. Because that's what In fact, is. somebody just texted He's that in a minute ago. Beast. Uh, beast. He was, at the time, a representative of the Roman Catholic Church. A church that... 40 years ago, when Pope John Paul II um, came to this country, had massive support. 1.2 million people saw him in the, the Phoenix Park. Uh, 39 years later, we live in a very different country and a very different attitude towards that church because of people like you. Because people like you have spoken out, have had the strength to pursue people like uh, Father Walsh with prosecutions and ultimately being jailed. They haven't all been jailed. Um, not all victims have, have, uh, have spoken out. How do you feel about the top man from the Catholic Church visiting Ireland the week after next? Um, yeah, I, have, I kind of have... Well, I can't say I haven't got a problem with it. The, the problem I have with it is um, basically... Um, the government paid out 1.5 billion up to 2017 on all elements of residential abuse including survivors uh, redress scheme related to survivors the church of Vatican owes about 1.3 billion still um, up to date as far as I'm aware up to 2017 <coughs> the government only in this country only received 209 million from the church. Um, and remember the government, what the government paid out, 1.5 billion. They didn't have a tree out the back where the money grew, Adrian. That came mm. from taxpayers' money. They took that out of the coffers to pay the bills. So I have a problem with a man that I, I don't know how much this trip is costing. 30 million, I'm hearing figures of. But I believe it's costing the state 5 million. Okay, well, 5 million. We leave it at 5 million. So, so the state are paying 5 million to fly this guy over. Um, so we can eat out of our cupboards again for free and he ha hasn't settled the b his bill and the church hasn't taken into account that the second largest organisation on the planet and probably if not the wealthiest I was in Rome in January and I decided to do the Vatican tour and when I tell you the opulence I know I've been there yeah uh, they could take one figurine off a wall and sell it for millions mm. to get homeless people and sort out this bill so that's where my problem lies Have you ever gotten an apology? Um, yeah, yes and no. Um, Archbishop Connell gave me an apology um, back a few years ago and I asked him why he was apologising. And he looked at me as much as to say, what a good question. I says to him, you didn't abuse me, you didn't rape me. Did you cover it up? And he said, no. I says, did you know about Walsh? And he said, no. I said, well, then you've no right apologising to me. I'd like an apology off the person that knew. And um, when I met Dermot Martin, and I just like to clear clarify a few things for the record if I can. Um, some people have their own views um, when it comes to Dermot Martin, the Archbishop of Dublin. Um, I've had, believe it or not, a very good rapport with that man. Um, anything I have asked for 
psychological help, counsellors, whatever I need, it's paid for. The only thing I would fault the the Archbishop on, they have a child protection wing in the Archdiocese um, ran by, and I'm sure his name is uh, Andrew Fagan. Again, I have a great rapport for the man. Any courses I want to do to, to better my education, they just get, they tell me to tell the college to ring them. They sort out the check and I get a phone call from the college to say I'm booked in, I don't even have to buy a pencil. But there's no aftercare with that. Um, they don't check in to see how I am, what state of mind I'm in. Like, are you keeping okay? Are you having a good week? Are you having a, How is this affecting you, Darren? So the last conversation I had with Andrew Fagan was a few weeks ago. Just to fill him in and bring him up to speed on where I am in life. And I did mention that the Pope was coming over. And I did mention that, he, could he mention to the Archbishop um, that, you know, maybe a meeting would be a good idea. I personally, Adrian... But sorry, just going back to what you, you said about uh, Archbishop Connell apologising to you. And you said yeah. he did nothing wrong. He didn't cover up anything. So why was he apologising? Could you not say the same thing? about uh, Pope Francis in that he didn't abuse you no he didn't but he didn't abuse me but where we're at now with the popes and especially with Archbishop Dermot Martin I'm sure that man isn't privy to half of what goes on in Vatican so I allow him a little bit of leeway on that but the Pope he has got to know everything he's got to know everything so based on those facts that I'm aware of and based on he is the leader of the Catholic and the Vatican Sea, I'd like me apology from him. Mm. Um, if he wish, wishes to apologise to Ireland, the taxpayer, and the, I suppose the, the, because the world media will be watching on the 25th, if he feels he needs to give a public apology, that's his own business. I would like a private meeting, heart to heart. And if a he's public, a Is a public apology not enough? No, I'd like it in public. I don't need certain things I'd like to hear and certain things I'd like to know that are exclusive to me for the mm. want of better words. Okay. And I'd like the man to know me story before he comes over so we can cut out. He seems to have a time barrier, Adrian. So if he learns about me on the way over and if he's stuck for time, I have no problem jumping on a plane down to knock with him and he can drop me back to Dublin on the way back mm. to, to get me apology, mm. to hear me story. All right. Um... <laughs> I'm going to take a very quick break and on the way after the break I'm going to be talking to on the phone uh, another one of uh, Father Walsh's victims he was also abused uh, by a, a different priest who uh, passed away in prison while he was on remand um, particularly about his feeling about the Pope visiting next week and we're asking you and we want you to text or WhatsApp 0877 98 98 98 I'm in the middle of a conversation with uh, Darren McGavin he is a, a survivor of uh, clerical abuse at the hands of one of the most notorious uh, clerical paedophiles ever in this uh, state um, by all accounts just a horrible horrible man um I'm fascinated by the words, the word that I, I did put pressure on you to come up with a word to describe Father Tony Walsh, <clears throat> and that was unhuman. Um, and that, you know, when people take that word and concentrate on what that word means, that describes a person that just... is unhuman. Yeah. <laughs> um, and capable of just about anything. I want to ask you a quick question. You mentioned before the break that one of the problems you have with the Archbishop's uh, offices is even though they have looked after you, they have sent you on courses and so on, that they don't follow up and ask, well, how are you today, Darren? Yeah, that's... So that's, that's, I'm going to ask the question. How are you today, Darren? Um, I'm in a better place, um, Adrian, than, than I was. Um, today I suffer with PTSD as post-traumatic stress. I suffer with psychotic depression, so I would auditory and visually see things that most people wouldn't. Um, I'm on medication. Um, sometimes I have to be uh, hospitalised. Sometimes if I go two or three days, I'm on day two now without sleep. So I know t if I don't sleep tonight, that's day three. I have to self-medicate to put myself uh, out instead of going into hospital for them to do it. Um, I suffer with nightmares and I suppose... I've always been challenged with my parents around this, that any relationship I've ever been in, I've had to disclose my past because 
you, you can't just say to people, I was abused and I was raped and leave it at that because they tried to blame parents and where we are parents and where we this. So that's why I've always had to explain my parents were drinkers with stuff going on. Every household in Ballyferma had stuff going on. And I can honestly tell you, when I was a, a young fellow, we would have spent a lot of time in the priest's house as well. Yeah. Now, thankfully, nothing ever happened. Nothing untoward ever happened. We did have things like you know, crisps and sweets and blah, 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 blah. And maybe we were being groomed for something, but thankfully nothing ever happened to me and I've nothing but good memories of that time. Um, but did my parents ask where we were every minute of every day? No, no they didn't. They didn't, they didn't no. Um, it sounds to me, though, listening to you talk, Darren, that you you some, somehow blame yourself in some way. Um. Sort of. Um, it came up in a conversation last night on another interview. Uh, one of the listeners um, had basically... I've been toying with this all night because it did keep me awake. He kind of basically said, you could have done more. Did you, why didn't you tell somebody? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And I tried to explain to the man, my age, I was seven. That, and, you know, you should have known there was something going wrong. I didn't know. I thought that was affection. Um, and then I had to explain in detail that I did tell somebody. I couldn't tell my parents because it was violence. I certainly wasn't telling that Christian brother because he was, there's no way that was happening. I told uh, a family member, a um, distant family remember, member, and uh, he asked me to show him what was happening. And I showed him. And he started abusing me as well and raping oh, me. Jesus. So... I just thought that was the norm, to be quite honest with you. It was only, as I said, when I was around 12, the Esther Ranson show came on, would you believe it? And when I tell you, my jaw hit the ground, when they kept using that word paedophile and predator and grooming, I knew then, only then, that this was wrong. Now, don't get me wrong, I knew when some of the raping was happening, it wasn't right, but I didn't know how to get over at that stage. Mm -hmm. But I said... You were only a kid. I was only, yeah, but as I said... I was in, my world fell apart at 12, Adrian. Uh, I was born in Tolman Road, as I already explained. So all my friends were from Tolman Road. So after 12, we, 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 we went from sixth class to first year. So I lost all my friends that I was in class with. I went to John's College. And then we moved home to, to Ballyferma Parade. I lost all my mates. The priest then was taking our circulation. So anyone that was giving me affection, he was gone. So when I tell you I was alone, I was alone and I went off my head. As a teenager? Yeah, because the parents got counsellors involved. I had to explain stuff and get, like, I remember one psychologist handed me a doll and asked me, would I show them what was happening? And I said, let me get this right. You want me to get my penis and stick it inside a doll? And your woman just said, oh, you can't say that. I said, but you just asked me to, to so I don't have any other, la I don't have any other language. That's what you're asking me. No, no, no. I said, will you, will you tell me what you're asking me for? So as I said, I went off my head and then, like everybody else has said, I was on the drug scene and ended up on heroin. But um, I came off the heroin when I was 21. Um, I didn't go on it by choice, as I said. Between the beatings and, and the bullying and the raping, I suffered with a thing called laryngitis. So I would always have a harsh throat. And I was given the, I suppose, like the cough bottle medicines. And I became addicted to the flavour. And I have a sweet tooth even today. I'm a chocoholic. Um, but I didn't know I was addicted to what it was doing to me. I wasn't aware chemically what mm. I was doing. And then me, me mother used to go to a bag and she had a little brown bottle. And when she took one of them, she was full of hugs and loves. And I just got a habit of, I wonder what that's about. Mm. And then I ended up on them. So, and then I just... Okay, so you went through a very tough time in your teenage years. Obviously, uh, later on, then uh, the, suicides, the, and then the court cases and everything else. But you, I could be wrong, but you seem like you're in a much better place today. Uh, even though, you know, having said you're you, you're sleepless nights and you're on day three now of no sleep and all of that, um, you seem much more grounded now. Yeah, um, I've done a lot of psychotherapy work with the HSC um, and med and medicated does not work and um, the medication suppresses the feelings and mm. um, what i done was i met i was introduced by mick pilo on the would you believe a program and uh, it was a documentary aired cardinal secrets and then um, mary raftery was the producer god rest her soul and I, I was introduced to professor Ivor brown who 
ran the Mental Central Hospital and I'm a very good friend of him today. He's, he's now, uh, I suppose, a mentor, a colleague as well mm. and a very good friend. I would, I would see Oivor probably twice a week, if very not good. more. So he introduced me in turn to a place called Dunderry Park in Trim, which is a place that does holistic healing and shamanic um, work. And it's all about self, getting back to yourself and that you're more than your baggage and you're more than your issues and your problems. And I've been there, I suppose, the last seven years. I've become a shamanic practitioner, advanced practitioner, transpersonal therapist. Wow. Um, let me so ask you, yeah. I, I just want to go to a call that I have on the line here in a second, but let me ask you just one question. Yes. 2018, Darren McGavin, are you happy now? I'll be happy when I get the apology and I'll be happy when I see this Pope. I think this Pope will be the saviour. I'm hoping he is. All right. Let me just cut across you now for a second and bring in uh, Alan. Uh, and Alan was also abused by um, Father Tony Walsh and was also abused by another priest called uh, Bill Carney. Now, Bill Carney, uh, subsequently, he was on remand in uh, prison when he died back in September uh, 2015. Alan, welcome to 98FM. How you doing? Alan... Obviously, you're very familiar with uh, with Darren's story, um, and I know you don't want to go into too much detail about the abuse that uh, that you uh, were subjected to. But yeah. the question we're asking today is how you and other people feel about the Pope's visit uh, next weekend. A lot of people saying this is an absolute insult to people like yourselves. How do you feel? I think it is an insult. As as Dan was saying there, all he's looking for is an apology as well, and that's all I'm looking for. I sent uh, numerous emails and I sent um, letters um, to the Pope himself, and not one reply has come back to me. So, and. I mean, there's been all sorts of speculation about whether he's going to meet um, victims' groups. Uh, there's been speculation about whether he will publicly apologise during one of the masses. Um, is any of that enough? Um, the public thing, and then I don't think so myself. Um, I think he should be uh, apologise to groups, if even solo on their on their own. But personally, I wouldn't be into Doing a solo would be into a group if he wants to apologise there. He is the leader of the Catholic Church and I think it should come from him, no one else. But, um, but is it good enough if the Pope were to, let's say during the Phoenix Park Mass on Sunday week, to apologise on behalf of the Church to all victims of uh, clerical abuse, just like... Um, the British government and David Cameron would have apologised over Bloody Sunday. He wasn't there, wasn't involved, but he apologised yeah. on behalf of the British. Is it not the same thing? Um, it would be the same thing if not ever, any abuse victims out there and like himself um, would not turn up there just to see the priest unless he's going to tell us that he's going to apologise to everybody. Do you get me? Okay, so... Do you feel that this visit by this Pope at this time adds insult to injury to people like you? Yeah. Yeah. It, does it open up old wounds? Or, one, or are you prepared to wait and see what happens next weekend? I'd like an apology before he comes out and shows his face to the, the public. You'd like an apology to your face? Not to me face, personally. No, just to, uh, an apology from him to us, a group of uh, survivors. Before he no. says anything publicly anywhere? Exactly. Mm. Is a, a public apology at one of the masses enough? If you're there, it'd be enough, wouldn't it? I, I'm well, not it'll, be, it'll be on the television. It'll be live on the television. No, I don't think it'd be enough now, personally. And, uh, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for the personal um, apology often for a long time after emails I've sent and uh, rest of posts I've sent that they've received. And, and do, you, do you ever get a reply? Never, no. And how many years have you written to the Vatican looking for an apology? Two years. And in two years you haven't even gotten a reply to your emails? No, not even a reply to your emails, no. 
Okay, I can see why you're desperate for, yeah. not desperate for an apology, but demand an apology. Um, and, That's uh, exactly, yeah. And I just feel that, like, I don't know about other survivors, but myself now, I think this is the last stage of my healing. You know what I mean? That I need the apology that sent me off to the, you know what I mean? Hmm. And uh, Darren, I see you nodding uh, here in studio, agreeing with uh, with everything that Alan was saying. That uh, yeah, as I said, we're all, all the survivors, and as I, again, I, I reiterate, I speak only for myself, but I do represent nine lads in Ballyferma, Adrian, that suicided. That, I'm, that I speak on their behalf and for their families, um, but I speak personally for myself today. And uh, yeah, me and Alan would sing off the same hymn sheet, um, but. I don't, if, as I said already, if the Pope wants to apologise for his part to the congregation, that's well and good. That, that's it, up down to him. Yeah. I personally want an apology to me face. And if he wants to do it in public to me face, I'll allow him that option. I'll even bow down to that. Does that mean he has to publicly name every single victim? No, no, no. I'm only talking about me, Adrian. If anyone else wants to, to uh, get their apology um, heard that way, I suggest they go about it the way I've tried. Um, as I said, if he's stuck for time and he wants me up there with him on the day to say, Darren McGavin, I apologise. I know your story, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I'm willing to do that to cut him a bit of slack and some time because he seems to be out. I can't understand how the Vatican City can prepare something years in advance, cost so much money and he, can, and he has a window of 36 to 29 hours. What's he in a hurry to go home for? He can't apologise. Yeah. Well, stay there for a second. Let me go to David. You're on 98 FM, David. How are you? Hello. Can you hear me, David? Yeah, I can. Okay, indeed, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, David, you went to um, school in Artain uh, with Father Tony Walsh. That's correct, yeah. yeah. Was he one of your teachers? No, no, I sat with him. Like, I'd be 64 years old now, you know. And um, Oh, so we you were in class with him? Yeah, we were, right. we were in a... It was a fairly new secondary school at the time. Okay. And I would have sat beside him there... You know, we had to double desks. Okay, so and, he uh, he was Tony Walsh at the time. Not Tony Walsh, yeah. Um, yeah. And what was this man like as a teenager? As Absolutely. I, I'm, you know, I, I said this to my family. Oh. Well, sorry, David, we're losing you there. We're after losing your yeah, signal. Sorry. sorry. No, I've, we spoke to this over the years with my family, you know. And when the uh, public, that's what he turned into, you know. So for... Uh, David, I'm going to have to ask the lads to ring you straight back if you don't mind because your yeah. your, your mobile signal is just too bad. I can't hear a yeah. word you're saying. Uh, lads, if you can ring uh, David back there, please. That's fascinating. I've never heard anybody speak about that priest uh, as a young, as a teenager himself. Um, that was a classmate of his who, yeah, I mean, can't believe what he turned into. Can't believe the, the monster that he, uh, that he turned into. In fact, I have him back on the line. Sorry. So, David... When you've heard, and I'm sure you've heard many, many stories about um, Tony Walsh, the the guy you knew as a kid, as a young fella, as a teenager, was what sort of a person? You know, he, he was one of those guys, like, very, very funny, a great impersonator, you know, would impersonate different teachers. And, uh, you know, he, he was, you know, he was a very shy, inward type of person, but... Apart from that, like, you know, he's the nicest guy in the, you could ever meet, like, at the time, you know. And I remember subsequently, a few years later, uh, I, would, I would have done my leaving in 72, you know. And uh, before the whole news about Tony Walsh broke, I was walking down O'Connell Street, uh, saw him coming towards me outside Easton's, you know. And I was actually dying to have a word with him, you know, because I hadn't seen him for quite some time. And uh, I remember he put his head down and he got real red in the face. And he went by, you know. It was only a few, maybe a year or two later, that... Um, you know, became apparent, like, this, you know, what he had got up to, you know. That he was nothing but, like the person you knew as a teenager? No, no. At the time, like, he, he would have been a, a guy that was, uh, say, during the leaving third year, he would have been a guy that would be contemplating going on to the religious, you know, maybe a priest or a Christian brother. And, but uh, but be, before he left school, did you know that that was the route he was going to take? Yeah, yeah, he oh, was always did. going to be right. cleric, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's fascinating. Thanks very much yeah. indeed, uh, David. Um, Mark, you have a suggestion where it comes to the Pope's visit. I do indeed. Yeah, off you go. Yeah, I'm just wondering, all the... Now, I'm not a victim myself, but uh, 
I'm just wondering, do you know the way the post gives out Holy Communion? Yes. Yes. Well, why don't they put a section of seats for all the victims and let the Pope give them Holy Communion and apologise as they come up one, one by one? So uh, you want them to, like, the body of Christ, I'm sorry. The body of Christ, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what happened to you, but here's the body of Christ. A lot of the survivors aren't even going to go to the Mass. They'll get one-on-one well, an apology, one by one, as they approach him. Have now, you... I, don't, I know he's not going to sit down here the whole story while he's giving out Holy Communion, but if he knows who he's serving were victims, a uh, sorry... A personal study as they're going up to him wouldn't be such a bad thing. Well, uh, what do you think of that, Darren? Um, not a bad idea for for somebody that would go along with something like that. To me, that would be very rushed. Are you going to either of the ceremonies in either uh, Croke Park or three of them, Croke Park, Knock or uh, the Phoenix Park? No. No. Not a chance. I was raped in the Phoenix Park uh, on the walkway down to the Furry Glen. There's a ditch on the right hand side and if you could walk down there with your, your, your dog and invite you to have a look halfway down the, the windy road you'll see a long pipe iron pipe and it's like a square concrete holding her up and underneath that he had um, a mattress and he brought me down there one day after giving or, well i assume we went to the hospital that day he was anointing somebody uh, he said they, they needed the last rites and he raped me in there i remember because he wiped me arse with the you know, that shroud they have around the neck, the purple thing. And how I know he was given the, the last, because I knew all the tools they used. So on one side of this silver box, I had uh, this, the holy bread. And on the other side, there was another lid and I had the anointing oil. Uh, and that's how I know what he was doing in the in the hospital that day. He parked at the Cheshire home and we walked from the Cheshire home down to, because you couldn't drive down there. And then he just brought me in a slipway because it was all bushes and brambles back then, but they've since cut it back, thank God. But that's, that area is still there and that concrete thing is still there and the pipe is still there. So when I'm having a bad day, I go down there and trigger myself again. Um, just to try and, I suppose, relive it. And, uh, Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you torture yourself like that? Because I suppose uh, somewhere inside me there's this little boy that's he's still lost and I can't find him. Um, I feel him and I hear him, but I just can't. I just can't find him. Even the day they were knocking down and um, the parochial house, I spoke to South Dublin County Council about going into the house before they done that, and they said they promised me they would that. Nobody would do that before a certain time. And I got, they said 8 o'clock. I got down there there at 7 and the bulldozers had started at half 6. And I couldn't go, they wouldn't let me anywhere near the site. So, as I said, there's a little lad inside me somewhere. Uh, I'm still searching for him. I can hear him. And I feel him. But um, even when I'm, I was down in Ennis Grown a couple of months ago for my birthday in February. And I visited a beach where I got raped down there. We were on a, an altar boy's uh, holiday down there. And... Uh, I, I always go to that area as well. I don't know why, Adrian. I, just, mm. I suppose it's just looking for that little boy. I feel like, even though I know I've done enough for him, um, I, I don't think I could do any more. Even in the healing process, I, I'm aware that I'd probably be direct. Like, this is 39 years in me, and it hasn't gone away. I still suffer with nightmares um, and flashbacks. That's why I'm curious to know why you would go and visit a place like that, which is just going to bring those memories and flashbacks and nightmares. Because I kind of, somewhere in my heart, I feel that the more you push yourself, it's like you, you don't want to go to the counsellor today, but you know if you go, you might feel better. So I feel that if I push my boundaries on pain, that I will become more, what's the word I'm looking for? My boundaries will be stretched and I won't feel as much pain, for the want of better words. Liz, you're on 98FM. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz. Liz, you don't understand why uh, people like Darren want a personal apology from the Pope over what happened to them at the hands of priests like Father Tony Walsh. Yeah, because w when you ask him, would a public apology be good enough? Like Darren and the caller that rang in after him, they both said now that they'd prefer a personal one. Mm. And I just don't understand why, because as Darren said himself, 
the Pope didn't abuse them. But even without that, there's not only, say, the, the altar kid, the kids that worked at Alta Ward and that that were abused by priests. You have the whole host of clerical abuse. And right through whether it's the priests you know, or the nuns and the Magdalens and the mother and baby mm. homes and all. I just wanted to know why it didn't. So what, you're, no okay, your point. You know, in, because your point being it would be nearly impossible. Really yes, okay, it'd be nearly yeah, impossible for him to get around to everybody. It'd be a personal apology to Okay, let, let, let me ask you, Darren, about that. That Practically speaking, and I know you're speaking for you, uh, but practically speaking, would it be possible for the Pope to give a personal apology to everybody? And there have been so many um, who were abused by somebody representing that church. Yeah, uh, the answer to that is yeah, and to your listener, yeah. That, that would be if that was agreeable to the injured parties and no disrespect to yourself um, who called in you weren't raped you were not abused your life was not destroyed you well I wasn't you're not sexually the one... assaulted by the Catholic Church but I did suffer a sexual assault yeah so well, by, by the hands of the Catholic Church not at the hands of the Catholic Church okay. no but, well, well, then, but I... I'm just, I just don't understand the need for a personal apology well, ever, so. well I hear you and I respect what you're saying so you probably have to respect where I'm coming from um, I've tried everything else to get closure in my life, and we're all sure, we're all. And, and, and sorry, would if Pope Francis invites you in next week, Darren? I'm really sorry on behalf of the church. Is that closure for you? Is that it over? No, it, it mightn't be. But what I'm saying, trying to say is, I've never had it, so it might be like an argument with your partner. Maybe I know it's a different analogy, but sometimes all we need is an apology. And, and that's the end. And of it. That's the end of it. Forgotten about. But because I've never had it. Um, I had it off it, O'Connell it, and I've had it off Dermot Martin but no disrespect to those two men they didn't do it they are not head of okay, the Catholic but it, Church again the difference Darren between a personal apology to you and a public apology at the altar in the Phoenix Park next week he's apologising to the congregation and Catholics that he represents is the public apology and the private apology is he's sorry for what I had to suffer at the hands of, of one of his ordained priests or ordained to the Vatican Sea at that time. So as regards his, uh, his visit next week, um, there's, we don't even know if there's going to be any sort of apology. We don't even know if he's going to uh, meet victims or survivors next week. Is this weighing on you, this visit? It's not weighing on me. I just want to clarify a couple, briefly, uh, a couple of, I know we're on the clock here. Um, I am not anti-priest. I am not anti-religion. I am not anti-faith. In, indeed, I'm in awe of anyone that are able to manage to hold on to their faith through all this. And I would say to them personally from the bottom of my heart, hold on to your faith, please. Don't let what happened to me destroy your faith. I can fight my own battles. You hold on to your God. And for anyone out there that does want to criticise we're all going to meet our maker someday and, and you'll be told you've an hour to live or two hours to live and he may be the person that you need to call on in your hour of need. So don't, don't push him aside now. And again, Archbishop Martin was put into position as Archbishop for a reason. He's done a stone, as far as I'm aware, a great job. And so is Andrew Fagan in the other part. The only thing I would hope uh, with the Pope coming over that he has a plan in place um, moving forward religiously um, and a concise plan what he intends to do in the midst of the old allegations and again with the recent ones in Pennsylvania a thousand children uh, over hundreds of priests I mean it just seems to be every time you turn a paper or, or turn on the radio it's a new allegation so no disrespect to Pope Francis he came in at the wrong time but he may have came in at exactly the right time that's what I'm trying to say um, I'm hoping that he will put in um an initiative and some protocols around transparency measures against civil law that he will hand over foils when he's asked for it. Um, they're not managing the abuse and the rape allegations um, effectively enough, honestly enough, or transparently enough for me in any way. Uh, Conan law needs to be, as far as I'm aware, it just need, it's, it's outdated, it's archaic. It needs to be brought up with the times, with our times. Um, and as I said, um, this can't be done by a head of state, our government, any government. It has to be willingly done. 
I would like Pope Francis to say, do you know what? I'm fed up everybody getting the blame for what they've done. That was in the past. So from now on, going forward, I'm going to set up and we're going to let the EU set up a new body, a new entity to divulge us and we will give all an every re relevant documentation to wipe our hands of it and let them deal with it and should the civil law or guardy want it they have to go to them for the information that's what i would like mm. on top of the apology as well all right um Aoife, you believe that the the pope needs to apologize to every single victim individually yeah i do is that, I think, uh, is it's, that min it's the very least he could do is that practically possible um, I think he could kind of make it practically possible. I don't know why he has to come here for such a short time. He could make a longer time. It's very important, and all these people suffer enough. I think that's the least they deserve. Okay, and uh, just finally, because I'm nearly out of time, Darren, you remember uh, Father Tony Walsh as a kid? Yeah, yeah, I grew up there with Darren and Valley Vermont. Darren, myself and Darren were good friends. He'd know, know me now for, for many years, Darren would. Um, the yeah, I, I remember he, he'd come into the schoolyard, like, and, and the kids would actually run towards him, you know? Mm. But what, what because, I, and, I, and this goes back to, to what Darren was saying earlier on, that he was he was worshipped by a lot of the kids. Yeah, yeah, because he was an elder as a parent later, like, you know, and, and he was a bit of crack, as Darren says, like, you know what I mean? Like, a lot of the kids would go over to him and say, oh, Father Walsh, Father Walsh, do well, do well, you know? But it seems to me that he preyed on the Thunderbrook kids, you know, like, as Darren said, what was going on in his own life and his own family. Mm. It was like, you know, that was an opportunity like where Darren was being vulnerable and he needed someone, as he said, to give him that loving, you know, and Father Walsh... He, li he, he, literally he literally prayed. He uh, literally prayed on that. I'm really sorry to cut across you, Darren, because I'm, I'm just out of time. Uh, and, and that was the, the unhuman part of that priest, that he saw you coming, basically, and he uh, spent time grooming you and then gaining your trust, and then ultimately raping and sexually abusing you for uh, for years. Darren, I still see the pain in your face, and I'm so sad to to see that. I really am. Um, I admire you for speaking so openly and so publicly as you do regularly, and to see the pain in your face really hurts me. It really does. Darren, thanks for joining us. This is a podcast of 98FM's Dublin Talks. Remember, catch the show live Monday to Friday at 10 a.m. 98FM's Dublin Talks with Adrian Kennedy.